What's up, everybody? And today we are reacting to the bomb that ended a war. This is by Not What You Think. I've never reacted to a video from this channel before. I will leave a link down below to the original video. Please go over there, give it a like, subscribe, and all that good stuff. Very, very important that you do that. I'm interested to see this. It looks like it's got some really cool footage, so I'm excited to see some bombs explode really that's all i'm gonna say uh, before we get started though question of the day comes from stop motion man he says question is there going to be any more warhammer great content as always luke keep it up thank you very much um yes there is going to be plenty of warhammer uh, 40k the new dark tide game that comes out in september i'm going to be doing a playthrough of that on the channel very excited for that and i'm going to be doing regular warhammer stuff anyway on terror tuesdays um so get hyped for that as for fantasy warhammer i have had some people ask me about fantasy warhammer that will be over on my new channel the sword and scabbard so definitely go over there have a little cheek peek at the new channel there'll be a link down below for that as well thank you for your question leave a comment leave a comment down below if you want a question answered on the next video but for now let's shut up let's pop this up and let's have a little cheeky peek you destroy a bunker made of concrete buried 50 feet underground especially when it's never been done before what that was 50 feet for us air force during operation desert storm as the iraqis intelligence yep. and the command personnel were stationed inside concrete bunkers so deep underground that the us and the rest of the coalition had no weapons to penetrate them also quick question if you do like these reaction videos um, let me know if you prefer subtitles on or off let me know in the comment section okay but in an unbelievable feat of ingenuity, engineering, and cooperation, the U.S. military designed, manufactured, and successfully deployed a weapon in less than four weeks. Wow. Saddam Hussein with no option but to surrender. And that weapon wow. looked something like this. But it so basically, they had the issue that there was these bunkers really far underground, and this was the solution, and they did it within four weeks, guys. What you think. Damn. Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in August of 1990 with the purpose of annexing Kuwait, okay. acquiring their large oil reserves, and also to avoid paying back the money that Kuwait had loaned to Iraq, which had funded Saddam's war against Iran in the 1980s. See, I actually don't know much about this war, particularly with, with Saddam Hussein. You have to remember, when I was in the Royal Marines, it was all about Afghan, right? And there was all this other stuff going on. There's so much politics when it comes to this that it's really hard to kind of grasp your head around exactly where it started, what was going on. Did it start with Russia going into Afghan? Like, where did it start and where where did it trigger? You know, was it 9-11? So I, I, sh I might do some videos on that. Let me know in the comments what you think. As economic sanctions proved ineffective, the United States led a coalition of 35 countries against Iraq. Yeah, okay. Launched multiple air campaigns with the focus of hitting Iraq's infrastructures. Yep. But soon, the quantity and quality of Iraqi bunkers became a problem. Okay. According to some intelligence reports, there were up to 40 bunkers near Baghdad, where several infantry divisions, the Iraqi Republican Guards, and critical command and control facilities were housed. So these bunkers, uh, they were obviously a, a, a key strategic part for Saddam and his uh, allies or his friends, his buddies, should we say. Um, so to design a bomb to do that is good, but it's... See, this is why you need to know more about context of war, right? Was it a case of just getting rid of these people? Did we need intel from these people? Did we know, need to know more about what they're doing behind the scenes, about different countries? So just blowing something up isn't always the best idea, even though it might be the most fun. Um, so I wonder I wonder why they went for the option of just blowing up these bunkers rather than doing some sort of style of CQB kind of um, close quarter to get in there, get intel, and get a little bit more up close and personal. Obviously, it saves allies' lives, right? Obviously. But it makes you wonder, right? These concrete bunkers were buried 30 to 50 feet below the surface, making them immune to direct hits from the BLU-109 hardened penetration bombs. That's very... Designed to penetrate only 4 to 6 feet of reinforced concrete. Ooh, look at that! Holy cow! A team consisting of U.S. Air Force wow. engineers and Lockheed Missiles and Space Company, which had developed the BLU-109, immediately started working on a solution. So they already had some sort of idea of what they needed to do. They just needed to be able to penetrate even further. My guess is, prior to this issue, they didn't really need to go that deep, so they never really had to... Like, the the problem was we can't go any deeper, so this is exactly what we're going to go. The, pro the, the idea was they probably didn't need to go that deep. So the reason they probably did it in four weeks was because... This isn't something that they've not had to do before. It was just something that they've not needed to do before. Does that make sense? Very interesting. 
to destroy the bunkers, a new weapon was needed, and yeah. many options were considered, from a dense penetrator version of the BLU-109 to an unmanned hypersonic vehicle. Interesting, the okay. The was that the development of these new weapons would at least take months, and they needed something right away. So how did they do it in so four the US weeks? The Air Force engineers at Eglin Air Force Base proposed a heavyweight bomb that could be dropped from a B-52 from yep. such high altitudes that would have sufficient kinetic energy to penetrate deep into a highly hardened target. Yep. The biggest challenge, of course, was producing the casing for the bomb. Yeah. It had to be able to penetrate through Whoa. deep layers of soil and concrete without being crushed. I've never seen these slow motion videos before. This is incredible. Absolutely so incredible. The idea that the Army 8-inch howitzer barrels might just have the right material properties to do the job. Interesting. So the Eglin Air Force engineers requested that the Army ship some of those barrels to Watervliet Arsenal. Watervliet Interesting. Arsenal was renowned for their expertise and precision in machining gun barrels, and they were soon going to attempt turning the howitzer barrels into the body of the bombs. Whoa, that's, that's such a cool concept. So they had this hardened metal for these weapons and they thought well why don't we just use that type of hardened metal on the actual missile that is super interesting and it makes sense because the the metal around a barrel has to be so strong if you think about it because even just like if you're talking like even something as small as 556 the barrel has to be relatively strong or the barrel is just going to explode with every round so i get it that's 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 something you don't really think about all that often is it but the bomb specifications were not even yet finalized and Eglin had to provide a go-no-go -no -go briefing to the top brass in about one week. Yep, it okay. It was decided that the delivery of the bomb should be done using F-111 fighter. Okay. the 6,500-pound bomb had to be downsized to 4,600 pounds. Wow. In the days to come... Which is, which is quite a significant downgrade when you think about how much force this has to, has to have to get through that amount of concrete. The Eglin Air Force engineers worked with Lockheed and also Rockwell who were the maintainers of the offensive avionics suite for the F-111. Yep. In parallel, the explosive pellets were being produced, wind tunnel time was booked at the LTV Dallas location, and a batch of BLU-109 nose cones was en route to Watervliet Arsenal. Interesting. During the go-no-go -no -go decision on Wednesday, February 13th, 1991, Eglin Air Base... The year I was born, it was a good year. ...committed to delivering two test rounds and two operational rounds in just two weeks. Wow. Go -ahead. By the end of that week, Watervliet had received the howitzer barrels, nose cones, and some specifications from Lockheed. That's incredible. That is genuinely At incredible. Waterville, the machinists were working seven days a week in multiple shifts around the clock to produce the penetrator's body. I External bet. hoops and rails were cut off from the barrel. It was then shortened to the penetrator's rough length, and his chrome plating was stripped off. Interesting. The machining of the bomb had to proceed, even though its design was not yet finalized. There's so much, as someone who's just in the Royal Marines as an infantryman, right? Obviously, I specialize later on. But as someone who just goes in to just be boots on the ground, there's so much more stuff behind the scenes you don't realize, right? You don't take into account, like, the weapons you're using, you know, like, the back of your hand. But do you know how they're made? Do you know what specific, like, type of metal they're made with? All this other stuff? That's stuff that I don't really know. Pretty interesting. Spec changes were literally phoned in while the machining was in progress. A 30-hour precision boring operation was in progress. Okay, 30 time, hours. The engineers worked to determine the final bore dimensions to ensure it would fit the nose cone. The gun's rifling, its wow. only remaining evidence of the weapon's former military role, was machined away. Yeah. In total, it's estimated that 15 engineering design changes were made during the manufacturing process. You have to remember as well, a lot of this is just math, really. How far do they need to penetrate? What, you know, how strong would the metal have to be to get through that? So you just got to have really smart people who are really good with math, just like anything, like when it comes to landing on the moon, like it's all math, right? You just have to take all these different variables and adjust them so that it works, right? And this is why it took four weeks. They've never had to blow something up that deep underground before, but it's not like they couldn't. It's just they've never had to. So they just had to do the math to figure it out what what strength they needed and everything and and the size and the, the 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 payload and everything. Something that was only possible through total team effort. Yeah, but as the transformation from cannon to penetrator progressed, 
The null scone was wow. taken to the body using a heat shrink operation, then preheated using special torches and welded into place in a 12-hour welding operation. Look how thick that metal is as well. That's unbelievable. And it's still going to go boom when it's under the ground. Multiple wing attachment configurations were machined onto the munitions body. As finishing operations were completed, the team prepared for assembly. Wow. That's amazing. On the morning of Saturday, February 16th, the first penetrator was loaded onto the U.S. Air Force's Air National Guard C-130 cargo plane. I wonder if they the tested it. The bomb was still wet. What? The second bomb followed a few hours later. The work on rounds three and four began immediately at Waterloo. It was still wet. Once the bomb casing arrived at Eglin Air Force Base, it had to be loaded with explosives. Yep. The 13-foot casing was larger than anything previously loaded at Eglin, so it could not fit inside the existing facility. <laughs> the loading had to be done outside. That's incredible. Having a structure tall enough to hold the casing upright, they had to dig a hole in the ground to put the nose of the bomb in. That's incredible. The things people do in war, the, the advance in technology during war is just remarkable, isn't it? It's absolutely remarkable. You remember some of the videos we reacted to of um, uniforms and weapons. From the, from the the change from before World War One to after World War II, within, you know, however long it was, I don't know the exact number, the change of technology was unbelievable, like crazy. One round was filled with concrete for a sled test, and the second round was filled with explosives in a 37-hour process. Wow. 630 pounds of molten explosives were poured in using buckets. What? By wooden rods, because the kettles were not big enough to melt all the explosives at once. The assembled penetrator was outfitted with a laser-guided head attached to the front of the body and stabilizing fins attached to the rear. That's incredible. The first GBU-28 was ready. Look at that. Showtime. That's absolutely incredible. On February 24th, 1991, the super penetrator was mounted on an F-111 and an inert test drop was initiated in the desert sands of Nevada. Oh, are we actually going to see it penetrate the ground? The weapon hit the desert floor at supersonic speed and buried itself over 100 feet deep. It was so deep that it was decided not to dig it up as the expense of doing so could not be <laughs> I bet! That's incredible! Later, a rocket sled test was conducted at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. Jesus! The bomb was fired against a 22-foot thick stack of steel-reinforced concrete slabs. The penetrator was found over half a mile away after having punched through the barrier. Over half a mile away. Oh my god, I guess it succeeded. It was obvious to everyone that the GBU-28 could do the job. Yeah, no shit. Satisfied with the results, rounds three and four were prepped at Waterfleet and packed with explosives at Eglin Air Force Base. Wow. They were then immediately flown away to Saudi Arabia in preparation for the drops. Yeah, when your only defense is, we've got really deep bunkers, and then the US are like, check this out, we just built it in four weeks. You're like, okay, yeah, we're pretty much buggered then, I guess. Sheesh. On February 27th, 1991, two Air Force F-111 fighters dropped their laser-guided penetrators on a command and control bunker suspected of housing top Iraqi military officials. Yep. The first aircraft missed the target. Oh, wow. The second one, however, was a hit. And if you look closely, in a few seconds, you will see smoke pouring out of the bunker's air vents. Wow. It that the bomb had found its way deep into the bunker, which was later verified using bomb assessment photos. Holy cow. The top of the targeted bunker. Just think about the force that has to have. That's unbelievable. With only one test drop, the GBU-28 holds the current record for the minimal number of drops to operational deployment. Yeah, bet. Most U.S. Air Force bombs undergo about 30 drops before being deployed. Well, they didn't have the time for it, right? Desperate times, desperate measures, you know? It's been argued that the hasty Iraqi ceasefire one day after the bunker was hit may have had something to do with Saddam Hussein learning that their last refuge has been defeated. Yep. The deep bunkers were no longer safe. Yeah. Although in the days prior, 
Iraqi soldiers were already surrendering or fleeing. Yeah, so there were already lose. There was already a losing battle, wasn't it? The day before the bomb was dropped, Iraq had announced its complete withdrawal from Kuwait. Yeah. But the GBU-28 bunker buster may very well have been the straw that broke the camel's back. I think it was. That was an absolutely phenomenal video by Not What You Think. I've never seen this channel before. Very, very good video. Genuinely really enjoyed it. There'll be a link down below to the original video. Please go over there and give it a like and all that good stuff. If you did enjoy this video as well, like this video while you are there. What a great video. What an absolutely amazing accomplishment that they did there in four weeks. Think about four weeks to do all that. Again, like I said, it's probably... The majority of it is just math, right? Let's be honest. But holy cow, that's a lot. Let me know if you knew about this already in the comment section down below. If you've got recommendations for more videos to me, for me to react to, comment section down below. Get hyped. Next week, we'll be carrying on with Modern Warfare. I'm just waiting for a part for my uh, computer setup to be able to carry on recording my Modern Warfare gameplay, guys. All right? Members, you're beautiful. You're amazing. I love you. I couldn't do this without you. I honestly couldn't make videos every single day if it wasn't for these amazing people right here finishing scrolling the screen. So thank you for supporting the channel as much as you do genuinely genuinely appreciate it links down below to all my socials including my two other youtube channels original adventures where you can check out vlogs and stuff like that and the sword and scabbard where you can check out all things fantasy other than that guys i love you all i'll see you in the next video have a wonderful day goodbye <laughs>